Good morning, everyone. This is the week eight Climate Academy event. And I'm gonna do a quick screen share to make sure that in these Zoom times, we are maybe in the same place at the same time, um, whatever place and time means to you at this moment. And we've got a whole bunch of people behind the scenes that I wanna start by acknowledging. Um, we've got our guest speakers for today, Dr. Lane Selman, Professor Lane Selman from OSU with the Culinary Breeding Network. We've got a student who's been working with the Culinary Breeding Network and Novik, um, Caleb um, is with us and my teaching colleague, Steve and a whole bunch of tech people. Um, Dave, thank you and all of you who have joined us to make these events possible. We have an open Q&A. It's a button that should be at the bottom of your screen. That will be open throughout the event. You can put questions into that at any point. Since we're recording um, and because of FERPA regulations, every participant's identity will be held in confidence. You will remain anonymous, but we will put your questions forward. So at any point, please feel free to use that Q&A and we will have two different sessions today where we will have a chance to put those questions forward for you and get answers. So the quick screen share, before I lose what's behind me, I'm hoping one of our guests will talk to us about this beautiful image of a radicchio that is behind and around my head. And I wanna point out that the green is turning pink. And even as we speak, it's turning more pink because this is still in a field growing. Okay, screen share. I hope that we are looking now at the Climate Justice and Resilience website. Thanks for the nods. <laughs> okay, we started the quarter. If you were with us for this, um, fall convocation began with Rebecca Solnit's A Paradise Built in Hell. And the question was, given this particular hell we might be in at this moment, how are we creating our own versions of paradise? And this might have to do with community resilience and addressing the issues of climate and social inequities surrounding us. Those events are now available um, to watch asynchronously. We then had the Tacoma campus hosted Dr. Michael Mendez, author of Climate Change from the Streets. A version of that talk is available to now watch asynchronously. Then we had Dr. Kyle White on Indigenous Climate um, Scholar on Making Kin with Climate Change, that event and the numerous publications that he made available to us are posted for you to watch. Today, Professor Lane Selman from the Culinary Breeding Network and Oregon State University. And this is hosted by the Terroir Miroir Program. So a shout out to Preeta and Steve, my colleagues, and to the students who are participating actively today. And here is our agenda for today, the introduction, which I'm just about to wrap up. Then Lane will speak to us about the Culinary Breeding Network. We'll do a short Q&A. And again, that Q&A is open to you right now. So you can drop your questions in at any point. Then we'll have a radicchio tasting lab with Caleb. And if you can find your way to this WordPress website, which should be available to any participating program, I am suspecting that your Canvas has a link to the climate lecture series. The tasting uh, form for today is there. Feel free to download it and follow along if you would like to. And then we'll end with a question and answer with both Lane and Caleb. Um, Zoom link is here and as soon as the session is over and again big shout out to the media staff who will make available a recording and I will put up that recording link. The guess is that it will be this evening or tomorrow morning and the very exciting thing is there are ongoing events with the Culinary Breeding Network, their variety showcase and their winter vegetable sagra which we're about to hear much more and the series wraps up this quarter with Dr. Pauline New talking about climate change and aquaculture. And a reminder, what's already posted for you is a lecture that Dr. Pauline New gave during the Anthropocene um, Consortium a few years ago. So that's available to get caught up um, with what we know at this point about climate change and aquaculture, specifically in the Pacific Northwest. Okay, I'm now stopping my screen share back to the main screen and the tiny little story I want to tell um, is that there was an event called the Cascadia Green Conference and it's happened every year for many years and will be happening this year virtually often hosted by the South Puget Sound Community College and Evergreen students participate. And the first year I was there, I was blown away by the quality of the food and I kept saying, who organized this? 
who made this? How is it possible that an event of this size has this kind of food available? And every single time I asked, whether it was for the morning homemade bagels or it was for the lunch, people said, oh, that's Lane. Oh, that's Lane. And then everybody I met who I was really, really excited by the conversations, they said, well, you must know Lane. Don't you know Lane? <laughs> so I can't tell you what a joy it was how many years ago to meet Lane. She's like one of my most favorite people on the planet and the work she's done is extraordinary. Final short story to introduce both Lane and Caleb and to express my enthusiasm that the two of them are now meeting each other. And you'll hear more about why they've had a relationship at a distance for many years. Um, I was at the Walla Walla Farmer's Market and I was so attracted to buy this display of radicchio. And you can see one behind me. You'll see many more varieties this morning. They are one of the most beautiful plants. And I was walking towards the display and the farmer stepped in front of me and said, I don't sell those until you taste this first. Now, this is kind of shocking because usually at a farmer's market, people are very excited to sell their product and they're happy to have you pick it up. No, I was not allowed to pick this up or touch it or even get closer to it until I had tasted this, this salad that was given to me. The recipe for that salad is available on the tasting form and we're gonna hear more about it from Caleb. And I made some of that salad to give to Caleb last night and I hope we all get to watch Caleb tasting that salad. The trick there was the farmer was tired of selling this beautiful plant and having people report that it was so bitter, there must be a mistake. Why in the world would you charge people to eat this bitter thing? The incredible wisdom of having me and all of us at the farmer's market taste the salad first was, it was this intense bomb of sweet, salty, an umami flavor, acid and bitter all wrapped into one. And I can tell you that after I tasted that, I wanted to buy every one of the radicchios was that was available because something happens when you put that mixture in your mouth. And there's a long evolutionary history that goes with that desire for that bitter flavor. Uh, although bitter gets a bad rap. So I hope you'll feel differently about bitter after this presentation. So welcome, Lane. Thank you so much. Welcome, Caleb. And thank you so much. Thank you so much. <clears throat> what a great intro. Um, okay. I'm going to say something about that, but first I'm going to share my screen. Oops, sorry. Um, okay, does everybody see that? One of this, somebody speak up if you can't see it, but I'm going to, yes. just, you can see it. Great. Okay. So um, thank you for the introduction. I think it, it's so funny, um, Sarah, because I actually used to work at a farmer's market um for about six years with gathering together farm down here in Oregon and I had we would have to warn people when they when they bought escarole which is also in the Chicoria genus we um would put a tag around it to differentiate it from romaine and to let and we'd always had that when we sold every head of it we would say to the people you do know this is not romaine right <laughs> So it was always came kind of with a warning and then, you know, also like we love it and explaining why we love why we love it and how to eat it. But, um, you know, it is um, a shocker for um, people that <laughs> have not had that be experience before and they might think that they're getting lettuce. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, just to address the um, Cascadia Grains Conference thing, I didn't make any of the food, but what you'll see in this presentation and what I'm what how I feel about myself at, with the Culinary Breeding Network is that I'm like the old school telephone operator. So someone gives me, you know, someone calls the operator and I then connect them with the person to, to talk with. So in that regard that with the Cascadia Greens Conference, I was, um, you know, hired to, uh, you know, organize all of the food because I happen to know a lot of food folks, which we're gonna talk about here. So um, you guys heard, this is the, you know, I'm gonna talk about the Culinary Breeding Network, which was a project that I started um, about 10 years ago. Um, I'm gonna go through kind of like how that came about because I think it addresses a lot of why it's important at all. And it does, it talks about climate, you know, we address climate change in that um, and seed sovereignty and a lot of other really important issues that I'm trying to get at in like a very fun and engaging um, way. So um, I'll just go ahead and, and start with talking about the background. And we started with um, Novik, which you mentioned, which is the Northern Organic Vegetable Improvement Collaborative. This is a project that's been going on for about um, 10 years now. No, I'm sorry, 12 years now, I think. Um, and Evergreen has been part of uh, in the past few years. 
This is a project that is um, led by Oregon State University, but also includes the Organic Seed Alliance up in Washington, um, University of Wisconsin at, at Madison, uh, Cornell University, and also that's not on this map is um, University of Colorado, or I'm sorry, Colorado State University. Um, and we are looking for an varieties of different vegetables that perform well for organic systems. So this means that we do trials of existing varieties that are available when you open up a seed catalog that are already commercially available, as well as working with plant breeders at each of these different institutions that is, that is um, breeding specifically for organic systems. Um, and I don't know if you've covered this before in any of your studies, but breeding for organic systems is very different than conventional systems. We need very different things. Um, as you can imagine, um, if you are growing, I use corn a lot of times as, a, um, as a, an example because corn really needs to, as a farmer will tell you, jump out of the ground and grow very fast to outcompete the weeds. So it needs to germinate fast and grow very, very quickly so that it um, gets above the, the canopy of the weeds um, because that's, that's the biggest issue that organic farmers have is that beginning like two weeks where we wanna make sure that the corn actually survives, right? And so if you don't have a corn that has been bred in an organic system, a lot of times it does not do very well because they kill all the weeds using an herbicide, which is something that would not happen in an organic system. And so you are never actually putting that variety to the test, which is the most important test that it's going to, to have, right? So I could get more into that and I will if you guys have questions about that, but there are a lot of varieties out there in the world when you open up seed catalogs that are not varieties that are really appropriate for organic systems. They're not that useful for organic farmers. So in this project, we are trying to find those that are available, that are um, avail you know, that are bred in, for organic and that actually perform well in organic and then create new ones. So we work with, it's a participatory project. We work with a lot of farmers. We grow out multiple varieties, usually about nine varieties of a particular crop in a replicated trial at the university farms and at these farms that you see here um, in these locations. And then we work with actual um, organic, you know, working organic farms um, in the area to then also grow these varieties so that we can see how they perform on farms as well as at our university farm. And as, as Sarah mentioned, um, Evergreen has been a part of that for many years now. Um, Patrick Mercer was um, a, a student previously that did a tomato trial, and now Caleb has done tomatoes, and this year radicchio, which is a big deal, and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Um, so this project kind of um, started the organic seed, uh, the seed. I mean, sorry, the um, the culinary breeding network, which I'll talk about how we got there in a minute. Um, but I wanted to show you this graphic, and potentially some of you guys have seen this, um, and it. it it kind of explains why there's a lot of varieties out there that are not bred for organic systems. If you look at these blue um, ovals, these are seed companies. Um, there's been an incredible amount of consolidation in companies and these larger companies buying smaller companies. And as you can see here in this maroon colored um, circles, um, these are also chemical companies. So these are chemical companies um, that produce chemicals like, uh, you know, herbicides and fungicides and insecticides um, that are, as they call, plant protections. Um, and they own the seed companies. And so, you know, this is the reason why we don't see a lot of uh, organic breeding because as seed consolidation has occurred, the ownership has gone to these larger companies that also are selling the chemicals. So we want to make sure um, that we have varieties in the world that are not dependent on these chemicals. Um, and there's a quote down here from Bill Tracy, who's a public plant breeder at university, he's a corn breeder at University of Wisconsin. Uh, this is another issue that at land grant universities, there's a lot less um, plant breeders than there have been in, um, in the past. 
and a lot more private industry breeders, a lot of which work for these companies. So he makes this statement saying, even if we assume that one or two companies controlling a crop were completely altruistic, it's extremely dangerous to have so few people making decisions that will determine the future of a crop. The future of our food supply requires genetic diversity, but it also demands a diversity of decision makers. So peppers, in Novik, we work with the farmers very closely to determine what we're going to do in this project. We have five crops that we work with every single year, and then we leave a space for the farmers to decide in that particular region which crop they want to uh, want us to work on. And one year it was peppers. And one, so this, it was pretty powerful to have these individuals, um, all these, all these different um, farmers that are growing produce, as well as the seed companies, like the smaller seed companies and the bigger seed companies together. Because what I heard from one of the farmers this particular year, this was in 2009, I believe, Tanya said, um, I think that we should work on peppers because I really love Gypsy and Gypsy is a hybrid and um, it performs really well, it tastes great. Um, and I can't find enough seed anymore. Last year when I went to order seed, I could not find enough seed. And then another person, another farmer in the room said, actually, I've had a problem with Gypsy as well. I found enough seed, but as I grew the plants, I found a lot of ones that did not look like Gypsy. Um, so then Frank Morton spoke up and he has wild garden seed. He's a plant breeder and a seed grower in Philomath, Oregon. And he said, the, thing, the conversation that's happening leads me to believe that that variety is not gonna be available much longer. Um, he said, when you cannot find enough seed and then you also find a lot of what, what plant breeders call off types, which just means their plants or the fruits on, uh, you know, for in this particular um, case, the fruits, which are the, you know, the peppers do not look like what they're supposed to look like. It means that that seed company is not maintaining that variety. Um, when you grow seed, you have to grow out all the plants and you have to pull out, they call it rogue. You have to pull out and get rid of all the plants that are weak, that have, uh, you know, say like it's falling over. Um, it is, um, got a disease, it um, does not look like it's a yellow pepper instead of a red one. You have to get rid of all of those. So we, he says, we know that that's when they're gonna get rid of something when it's just not maintained as the, the same like high level of quality. Um, and that can be for a lot of reasons. One of which we just saw where we saw like the larger companies buying the smaller companies and potentially the a smaller company own Gypsy because it's a hybrid. It's something that is own, owned, right? It is something that you have to create the inbred parent lines and you cross it and you make the hybrid. And so that is belongs to a company and once you save the seed of a hybrid, it does not it is not the same thing. And we could get into that later if you want to, but I didn't add that here because it gets very long to, to um, you know, explain all of that and why, but you do not get the same thing. So, but if you have an open pollinated variety and you save the seed, as a farmer, you could save that seed and grow that thing the next year and it will be the same thing. But if you save the seed from the hybrid, it's going to express the genetics of um, the parents, and then it might look very different than what you want. So it addresses seed sovereignty to be able to, um, you know, have more options for open pollinated varieties. So the farmer said with this in mind, oh, sorry. And so, you know, going back to this, a lot of larger companies buy smaller companies and maybe a larger company already has enough peppers that are similar enough to Gypsy that they don't care about Gypsy anymore. And they're going to sell out the rest of their seed that they have um, in, in stock, you know, and then it's gonna be gone. And this is something that happens a lot 
um, for all farmers, but because organic farmers kind of have less choice out there in the world because there's not that many varieties that are appropriate for organic systems, they do have less choices. So when they find something like gypsy that works, right? It works for our environment. This is another thing that you might or might not know about is that peppers um, do really well when they have like more heat in the evening time. We have cooler um, evenings. So um, we really, we have less peppers that we can actually grow because we need to have very early maturing ones. Um, because one thing that in Novik and the farmers that I work with is that we would rather grow all of these outside and not on plastic. When you look at this picture, they are not on plastic and they are outside. And this is what we want to breed for is for our specific climate um, and not be using plastics. So there's a tall order to find this. And so, so we decided this year in Novik that we would focus on finding a variety that was open pollinated that was very similar to Gypsy in that, and they told us what we call the design brief, which is like, what do you want? Like, tell us what we're gonna evaluate for. What do you want in a pepper? We want something that is um, that is early. These are really nice lush plants, right? We want very nice canopies that will cover the fruit so they don't get sun scald. We want plants that don't fall over, that don't get diseased, that don't get eaten by insects that, you know, and all these things, they tell us agronomically what they want. And then we go out and evaluate for them. Caleb is doing that right now with radicchio. Last year, he did that with tomatoes and we look at them. So we had not been talking about what they taste like though. So that's where kind of, I kind of went off on my own with Novik 10 years ago, where I said, well, you know, if these things don't taste great, if we're gonna find this or, you know, a really great OP, open pollinated variety that's going to grow really well and compete with, you know, all the other peppers and be just as good as gypsy. We got to know how it tastes. That's very important. So um, I kind of branched off on my own and started doing all these tastings. And I knew a lot of chefs because I, I told you I worked at the farmer's market and I met a lot of chefs and I asked them if they wanted to get together and taste peppers. And I mean, I did it on a Monday when chefs have the day off uh, in the middle of the day. And they're like, yeah, so we got together and we had nine different varieties of peppers that we had trialed, uh, we had, uh, we had um, evaluated in the field. And um, this, by the way, let me tell you right away, this is not the way to do it, but this is the way that I did it because I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> so um, this is, so we had it a whole, as you can see up here on the top left, there was a whole, um, you know, pepper that they would see that they would look at. There's a halved one so they can make their judgments there. Also, let me tell you that the, the variety name is here, but um, when we did the tasting, we turn it over and there's like a, uh, there's a code. So they don't know the name so that they're not influenced by that name. We had them taste it sauteed, raw, and then also roasted. And as you can see the ballot down here, I had them evaluate for appearance, flavor, sweetness, texture, overall rating. And this is just nine. And then there's like, on this ballot and then there's four more. So this is the wrong way to do it because this is way too much to do. Um, you guys probably have been, you know, Caleb has probably been dealing with this differently. Um, I still work with Patrick who worked, was a student at Evergreen and worked with tastings um, and went on to get his master's and he has a lot better way of doing this. <laughs> but this is how I did it at the very beginning because I just did not know um, like, how to actually do this. I'm not a sensory scientist, but it was a, nonetheless, it was a very, very interesting um, experiment. But so what we did was we had about 30 chefs and farmers and people from the farmer's market get together um, and taste these. And they did it all in silence, right? We did it all in silence, like fill this all out. God bless them. They like, you know, they, they filled out all of this information. It was so much, it's exhausting to do this much. Um, but then afterward, we turned in the ballots and popped open some Prosecco. And I just started talking to people um, about what it is that they liked. And what they told me was something very different than what I was actually asking. So these are two open pollinated varieties that come from um, Wild Garden Seed, Frank Morton, that were in this trial. 
it's a longer story to tell you where he came up with these, but these actually come from the same parents. That was a hybrid that he saved the seed from and he started, he grew out. Like I told you, when you grow out seed from a hybrid, you're going to get different things. Well, he got a lot of different things. He got orange ones and yellow ones and bell shapes and you know, all these different shapes and sizes. Well, one of them, it was a stocky red roaster on the left here that has very rounded shoulders and very straight walls. And then on the right hand side, you see Jolene's rustic Italian, which is much more crumply. It looks and it has that sunken top. As you look at it, you can see that this would be a pain to cut in your kitchen. We've all done this where you decide, oh, am I going to cut straight across and just compost the whole top of this crumply one? Or am I going to, you know, it, it's not as easy to process in the kitchen and it's not going to cook as evenly if you're going to roast it. Stepping back right now and telling you guys this is um, it's that what do you call it imposter syndrome where it seems this is obvious like why wasn't I thinking about this, but I wasn't thinking about this at all, but the chefs pointed out that they would always even though both of them tasted really good there's no significant difference in when I crunched all the numbers with that ballot there's actually very few significant di like differences in that. But in just talking to people, every single one of the chefs told me that they would choose the one on the left. They both tasted good, and but they really wanted the, 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 the shape and size of the stocky red roaster. And to me, this was a huge aha moment. And I thought, oh my God, like, I don't know if plant breeders are thinking about this at all. And we really need to be much working much closer with the end users than we are now. Um, particularly the, 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 sh the breeders that are at universities, I think um, were more disconnected from the end user than the smaller, um, the smaller seed companies that we were working with. Um, and I don't know if you know this, but it takes a really long time to breed a new variety, typically about 10 years before they're released. So it's not something we want to add at the end. It's something that we want to be engaging with the, in the, the end users um, from, you know, pretty soon after the, you know, at the beginning first, you know, probably one to three years. So this was a really um, pivotal moment for me. And this is when, um, oh, let me see before I say that. Um, this is Frank. I forgot I had this one in here. So this is Frank Morton. He's with Wild Garden Seed. Um, the reason I put this picture in here is because Frank is an amazing plant breeder. He did, really does actually has worked a lot with chefs in the past. He really does have a handle on what um, what chefs like and what they want. Um, but at the same time, he's very disconnected. He's very far away. The point of this picture is he's alone in his field. He is with his lettuce, which is he's, he's known for, and it's going to seed. This is what happened. This is what it looks like when you let it keep growing and it grows to seed. Um, and then on the right hand side, here is a one of his breeding plots where these are all siblings. These are crosses that he's done by hand with mother and father. Um, and then he has hundreds and hundreds of these plots every single year and he goes through and he makes selections. But as you see, he is by himself in the field. So the idea is I would like him to be engaging with more people. Um, to be able to make those um, selections. Um, one thing I'll talk about with climate is, I mean, Frank's varieties really are the thing that made me, when we all, made me start the Culinary Breeding Network because when I was growing all these varieties um, at the university farm and then on, and like evaluating them on farms, I was completely shocked at how amazing they were. They were like, we, you probably know that hybrids are known for being very, like yielding very high and being incredibly uniform. Open pollinated varieties are often criticized for not being those things. I could not tell the hybrids from his open pollinated varieties because they were so uniform. And it really changed my perception also of open pollinated because I saw that if you actually are a very diligent and talented plant breeder like Frank is, you can have open pollinated varieties that are just as good as hybrids. Um, and one thing that he does is, is more than any of the other breeders that I work with, I feel like he really puts these his new his varieties and his plant populations to the test as far as climate change is concerned. 
um, and disease resistance. He grows his plants at least one season, if not more during um, his selections um, in a place where he calls Hell's Half Acre. So it's a, it's a place in his farm that is um, terrible soil, um, riddled with disease. Um, and he really puts those plants to the test because as John Navazio says, who's another plant breeder at Johnny's Seeds in Maine, we don't need any more prima donna plants. Like we don't need any more varieties that are released that have to be grown in conjunction with a lot of chemicals um, that can't withstand um, stress. Because as we move into the future, we're already experiencing it now and have been for quite some time. There is what Frank calls climate chaos. Um, we see swings in, um, in differences in temperature. Um, we see um, more dramatic events as far as heat is concerned, as well as cold. Um, and plant breeders like Frank um, use those really dramatic events like a very cold um, freeze that would be something that would be pretty devastating to a farmer is a selection event for him and is actually a positive thing. One year he had a hundred kale plants out in the, in the um, field when I think it, we got, he got um, temperatures that were down in the teens and it killed almost everything. And someone asked him, aren't you disappointed? And he said, no, I have five plants that survived. And those five plants are for the future. So, um, really focusing a lot on um, making sure that we have very resilient genetics uh, in our varieties is what um, Frank is really focused on and I appreciate so much. So the following year after we did our, our, our um, roasting pepper, um, you know, the sweet pepper tasting um, was the first time I ever invited someone, a, a group of people uh, they were chefs and farmers and farmers market people again to actually participate in a breeding project. And so these are mild habanero peppers that were bred by um, Jim Myers at Oregon State University. And he was, these are tropical peppers. They are, um, the, the annuum is the species for a sweet pepper and these are chinensi. So they're much longer um, peppers that are originally from South America. So they're usually not something that we can grow very well here, again, without being in a hoop house, without being on, you know, planted into plastic. Um, and he has been doing selections for earliness um, so that we can actually grow these peppers here. Um, and he noticed in one of his breeding lines that it was very mild and he really liked that because a lot of times it's really hard to enjoy uh, habanero peppers because they're so hot and you can't uh, really experience the flavor because of the heat. So we invited the chefs to participate in, in, in a breeding project where we hadn't had anything released yet and they got to um, choose the phenotype, right? The phenotype is the way that something looks. So the shape, size, color, and also the flavor, they got to be a part of that. And so uh, it was at that point that I said, gosh, I would really like to be able to um, create more opportunities for the breeders to be interacting with the end users. Um, so that is, I'll go back to that in a second. And so that is really like the mission and like the creation of the Culinary Breeding Network always to bring the, all these individuals together and to build communities of plant breeders, the seed growers, farmers, produce buyers, chefs, and all these other stakeholders to improve quality in vegetables and grains. Um, so to go back to this, I, I made this um, a few years ago when I was thinking about, you know, we have our big scary, scary schematic of like what the industrial seed world looks like. And someone is working on creating, um, this is what that the other side looks like. This is what the organic seed world looks like. Um, but until then, <laughs> I, I kind of made this little onion that showed all the different layers of um, the, the things that, um, the values that are within this community that I interact with and I'm part of that I see when I organize these events and I'm bringing to the attention of others, the seed companies that are doing this work and the individuals that are doing this work. These are some of the things that I think about, um, that they, what they care about, heirloom preservation and flavor, organic breeding, of course, environmental health, farm worker rights, 
biodiversity, open source genetics that we talked about. So like we didn't even talk about patents, but patents are a whole nother subject that you could talk for hours about. Um, spirituality in doing this type of work, um, nutrition, tradition, you know, preserving traditional breeding methods, cultural diversity, resilience, food culture, social justice, joy. And, you know, I didn't put this in the middle because we're talking about climate right now, but climate chaos, breeding, thinking about climate chaos when you are breeding is like, I think, such a core for so many of these individuals that are doing this breeding work and seeing um, the uncertainty of the future. And I want to, you know, for me, I want to bring as much attention to these breeders and support their work as much as possible so that we do have these genetics and these varieties in the future because um, that's what the future holds. And um, it doesn't have to be scary, um, but we definitely have to be equipped to go into a future that um, has more climate chaos. And I believe that these breeders are, are doing that work. Okay, so um, the way that the Culinary Breeding Network works is um, I've kind of um, am asked to be a part of a lot of different projects. And then I also have a lot of my own projects, but um, when I work with other pro bigger projects that are like, like Novik and this barley one and then value added grains one, I am hired to work on a larger um, like, like research project that might be a very large research project that's a national project to create the relationships with the stakeholders so that to identify those end users um, and bring them into our project to build community with them. And then also to create engagement through um, interactive and uh, events and activities, which I'm gonna show you some of those things. Um, so we talked a little bit about Novik, the barley and the value added grains ones uh, projects are very similar to Novik, except that they are these particular grains. Um, there's an eat winter vegetable project that is a, uh, a project that I lead um, at Oregon State University, I'm going to tell you more about and as well as radicchio. So these, um, I've I've started focusing quite a bit on winter vegetables because it is an area that needs more support because we can grow a lot of vegetables here in the winter time, but people are not eating a lot of local vegetables in the winter time. Um, so I really wanted to focus on that so that um, we can support our farmers all year round so that they don't have to lay people off in the winter time. Um, and so that we're eating local, not just seasonally, but all entire year round. Um, just here's John Navazio, who I told you was uh, the guy who said, let me move this over, um, that we, uh, we don't want any more prima donna plants. <laughs> so he, he works for Johnny Seeds and he's just, this is a quote just saying that winter vegetables are the fastest growing green segment um, in the market, especially radicchio, um, other chicories, uh, spinach and purple sprouted broccoli. So um, that part is very exciting. And um, this is the Eat Winter Vegetables project. Um, this project is actually about to end, um, but there's a few more events that we have that I'm gonna to to, uh, tell you about. Um, but the focus of this, this project is promoting um, these nine different winter vegetables. We actually started with eight, and then there's a big collard project um, that has started nationally. And so we added college to it. So it's growing out a lot of different varieties of each of these to be able to show people they're at field days and it has a lot of outreach. So it's promotion and outreach. Um, we have field days, we have the Sagra events and the variety showcase events. And then we also have a, um, a website, eatwintervegetables.com. I'll quickly go through each of these types of um, these outreach. So last year before COVID, um, in December, we had the Sagra. And so the Sagra is a festival in, um, in, in, in Italy. They're um, festivals that usually happen in, they happen in bigger places and they happen in smaller villages and they celebrate local foods um, that might be something that's grown in that area or a traditional dish to that area. And so there's like, I don't know, 25,000 Sagre every year in Italy. And I was inspired by them and wanted to bring that concept back to the US, um, but also add some more education with it. So we um, partnered with Friends of Family Farmers and there's a they every year have a really big Feel Your Pantry sale. Um, and so we, it was basically a large farmer's market and the Sagre component of it is um, 
chefs and culinary educators and advocates um, all around the edges that are kind of like the vegetable cheerleaders. And so I'll, tell, I'll show you what we were doing, but it was very successful. You can see we had 31 farmers involved and they sold more than $87,000. Before we added the Sagra to this event, it was about $25,000 less. So there's a lot of value in this um, Sagra. Um, it was in a really big space. Here it is. It's just, it was pretty amazing this year. So we, had, did, we did have a grant. We were able to rent a really nice space. Um, and we had, so for each of the vegetables, we had stations all around the farmer's market where people were showing us um, it was in the center how to actually butcher winter squash, how to cut winter squash, because a lot of people are afraid to cut large winter squash. Um, we had uh, different like cooking advocates basically in our community do cooking demonstrations of like cabbage and celeriac. People could taste the things and then they could get, and they were all very easy to make at home, but delicious um, things that they could, you know, dishes that they could make with the vegetable. And we gave away the, the recipes there and encouraged people to buy them at the market and then continue to eat those things um, all entire winter long. Um, we had a, like a total geek out room we call the Exploratorium where we got really way more in depth with radicchio as well as garlic. Um, so you could engage with this is um, Andrew Still who owns Adaptive Seeds. You could talk to him about garlic seed. We just really geek out on, um, on these two crops in particular. You go to the WeWinterVegetables.com website. There's tons of um, information on there about the different veggies. And there's also all the recipes that we had and people tasted um, are posted on there as well. Another Sagra um, that um, I've organized each year, this has been the third year this year, is the Sagra. And it's we've changed it to Del Radicchio, which is the proper um, grammar, uh, Sagra Del Radicchio. Uh, this happens in Seattle, Washington. And it's um, a similar type of event. There's no sales, actually. It's um, similar to the Variety Showcase, which I'll tell you about but in a moment. But it's all about radicchio and trying to get people excited about radicchio. There's tons of different types. Um, I'm going to tell you about a zine that I've, we've, we've, we've created and where you can get that. Um, but it's um, a, just a great place to talk to radicchio farmers, talk to chefs that specialize in radicchio dishes, talk to seed growers. Um, and just really um, just learn a lot about a different crop that we really want people to be more, more excited about eating because it is something that is so appropriate for us to be eating in this climate. Um, but it is like Sarah was saying, it's a little bit of a hurdle for some people initially because they're like, oh, it's bitter. I don't like this. So there's a lot of education that has to happen on like how to prepare it and, and what to pair it with um, and then once people get into it, they're like, they're, they're changed. But it is something that we should be growing and eating more of in this region uh, because it grows very well. It holds very well. It stores very well. Um, and in a time when people in the wintertime will go back to the grocery store instead of going to farmer's markets and start buying lettuce from Southern California, this is something that we could, we'd like to change people's minds about so they're eating salads or radicchio instead of lettuce during the wintertime. Oh yes, and so this year, we, you know, because of COVID, we couldn't have our Sagra in person, the Radicchio one. So we did Rad TV, um, and Rad TV was a whole entire day long of like Radicchio geek out. This is like the impact report, but just to let you know, it, it was incredible. We've never even had a, a you know a YouTube site before. I had to start all this stuff just for you know for Rad TV, and we had thirteen hundred and forty five unique viewers during the day. Um, we had people from Italy, 5% of the people were from Italy, 25% um, were from other countries. Um, and the, the programming you can see on here on the left-hand side, we had everything from history to travel. Cribs was like farm, um, farm tours, cooking, um, all different types of things that we had that day. You can go back to, at the bottom, I put the YouTube channel. You can go to YouTube and watch all of this um, in and you can go to the specific, you know, if you just want to go to the cribs, you can go specifically just to that one and not watch the entire thing. But this was a huge success. We had so many people that were really engaged with it. It was awesome. Um, the Variety Showcase is another event that I put on each year. And this really is those breeders I was telling you about that um, really focus on breeding for organic systems 
we like to, we showcase at this um, variety showcase. And it's a place where you can go look at and taste new varieties as well as varieties that are in development. Um, and we want to give people the opportunity to talk directly to plant breeders about what it is that they want in a particular crop. So this last year, I've done, let's see, I've done nine of these now. This last year we had over 700 uh, attendees. We had over 130 participating breeders and researchers and farmers and folks that were at the tables. Uh, and we had 40 different tables that featured um, vegetables and grains. So as you can see, like on the top right hand side is this is our squash table. Um, and this is um, Alex Stone, who is a, a researcher in Michael Mazurik on her left that is a squash breeder and they are geeking out all about squash, um, talking about squash, you get to taste things, different squash side by side. And then one of the squash that we really wanna bring attention to um, that the plant breeder has focused on, we have them taste something that the, the chef has made with it. So this entire room is like, that's why I made the onion. Cause when I look at that, when I, look, when I look around that room and look at all these 40 tables and all these 130 people doing this work, it's like, what are, like, why are they doing the work and what are their values? So the, the, the values in the onion are like, the, that's what I created for this particular event. When I look out in the room, this is what I see is what this community is all about. So there's like, people really go out and make everything very beautiful and lovely. And so this is some of the, this is some of the Rosa um, um, radicchio. And this one has actually been forced, which is a whole nother, um, <laughs> another presentation. And you can learn more about that during radicchio week, which I'm gonna tell you about in a moment. Um, oh yes, we just, we also went on a radicchio expedition to Italy. So um, I've just been awarded a grant to work specifically on radicchio in Washington. Um, and create an international exchange with radicchio growers in Italy and seed companies in Italy. And in January, right before COVID, we snuck it in there. We got, we got to go to Italy and travel all through the uh, Veneto and some of the regions that are north of the Veneto um, where radicchio is um, pretty ubiquitous. ubiquitous. Um, a lot of us went, uh, we had 22 individuals, farmers, chefs, and other radicchio advocates went and visited a lot of farmers and also um, seed growers there. We've brought, we've created relationships where now we will have this um, really fantastic radicchio seed from Italy um, available in the United States. Um, they really are so far ahead of us with radicchio because this is a, this is not a you know, a, a strange thing. Radicchio is something that Italians eat all the time. Um, it's a staple crop like lettuce or something. So their breeding is like, you know, decades and decades ahead of ours. So to have the better seed here will really change the game for farmers here and growing radicchio to be able to have access to that seed. Um, we went and visited some great guys that own a couple of different um, uh, seed companies. The bottom right hand side here, these are all varieties that have been forced. Um, and the, so they are grown out in the, they're all grown out in the, um, the field and then they're uprooted and they're put into these chambers that are filled with water and suppressed from light. And then they create these absolutely spectacular looking um, radicchio that look like, that look like flowers. Um, here's another one right here. Um, the guy in the right hand side here uh, Nicola is that's the chamber that I'm talking about. And so you can see the plants down there um, beyond him that are still in the chamber are really gross looking. Um, <laughs> but they um, you just slough away all the outside part that's rotting and then you get these absolutely beautiful um, specimens that come out that look like flowers. And at the end of this, we had a, um, a an event in Italy called Jazz and these fantastic, um, and young, which is really cool because you don't see a lot of young farmers a lot of times in Italy, um, had an event that's similar and, and inspired by the variety showcase and the saga events that we've been doing here to show off some, a lot of their traditional crops and experimental crops that they're growing there as well. And so they had these really beautiful tables that they got really artistic and showed us a lot of interesting things that they grow that we don't have here. And some of which we will have here this next year. I've started a 
co uh, collaborative project with Uprising Seeds out of Bellingham, Washington with one of the seed companies in Italy. And you'll be able to get some of these like this brassica on the left-hand side and some of the radicchio that we have not had here in the past, we will have um, this coming growing season. So be on the lookout for that. Um, this is just, um, I wanted to show you that we brought a journalist with us that really loved radicchio and she wrote a really good piece and heated. You can find this on the website under press um, about um, us going and looking at radicchio. Um, this is a quote, this is Jason Salvo, who's, um, this is him in Italy, but he grows right outside of, at local roots farm outside of Seattle. Um, and, you know, I think that there can be a lot of criticism sometimes in thinking that these more obscure crops might be like elitist, but it's not how I feel about it at all. I feel like um, radicchio is actually um, something that is really important for our local food system. Um, it's something that we have to get people used to eating, um, but it really is about supporting local farmers and finding those things that they can grow well here um, and we can be consuming here to support our local farmers. Um, and so this is a quote uh, just about like, um, about getting to that and how it really does um, address these things. And it's not really just about fluff <laughs> as some people I think want to um, criticize it as that. Um, so I wanna show you a couple more things. I'm just leaving you with this. Here's some websites you could go to, culinarybreennetwork.com. We have eatwintervegetables.com. We've got um, Eat Winter Vegetables, Eat Radicchio. Um, then we have a YouTube site. Please follow on Instagram. You can find a lot of information there. Um, that's the most up-to-date. I want to show you quickly um, the, I'm gonna show you that video in a moment. Oh, sorry. I'm going to show you, oh, I was going to show you the Etsy site. So I was like, I should give you guys a quick tour here. There's a lot of different um, things you can get on the Etsy site. They're including a uh, radicchio zine. Um, I will send Sarah the PDF for this so you can read it for free. Um, and, but if you wanted a, a copy of it, you could order a copy on this. Um, we also have barley zine. We have like educational information and we have posters. Um, posters about radicchio and where they're from. I've just recently gotten really excited about eggplants. So there's some eggplant stuff in there. So there's that. Um, upcoming event. So one thing I didn't mention there, but the, the Sagra, the first Sagra I was telling you about that focused on all of the different nine um, winter vegetables is happening as a virtual um, event this year. And so it will start um, pretty soon, November 30th. So you register here, it's all free. You just register here because we wanna just uh, be able to capture people's information. And so they will be different weeks that happen throughout the entire winter time with different, and some, some of them they already have like the speakers and tell you what they, um, who the speakers will be. But it really is focusing on the background, uh, centers of origin and domestication of different crops. Um, folklore, culinary attributes, um, medicinal properties, just really like in-depth kind of information about each of these crops. Um, we have another radicchio week. Um, we have a collars week and I do hear that you guys are reading um, a cooking gene. Um, Michael Twitty is one of our pre uh, presenters there. And then, so we have weeks all the way throughout um, to the end of March. Um, so again, they're all free. We really hope that you do um, come to them. It'll be at 10 a.m. our time um, every day of the week on those weeks that we do have them. I did have a little video I could show you um, if we still have time for that. Would you like me to do that? This is from the um, Rad TV. Like I said, you can go and watch any of these um, presentations uh, on the YouTube channel. Um, so, but I was just going to show you really quickly. This is Davide, who is a farmer uh, in the Northeast uh, and in Fruili, which is a, a region that's close to the Veneto. And his name is Davide. He was a chaperone for us and a translator. And he made this video. I asked people in Italy to make short videos and we call them come se dice, which means how do you say, like, how do you say, um, radicchio in your dialect because they're if anyone's been to Italy they're very different from like five miles down the road to five miles down the road so um, I asked them if they could talk a little bit about the radicchio that's grown in their area 
Um, and he made a really cute video that it was one of the most popular videos. And I'll show this to you. It's three minutes and then I'll be done. Ciao, amanti del radicchio. Come state? My name is Davide Zimolo. I work for the Italian Association for Organic Agriculture. And last year I started this market garden as my side job. Last winter, I had the honor of participating in the Radicchio expedition by chaperoning the group around some cool farms in the region. We are in Friuli Venezia Giulia, which is the region located in the northeast part of Italy. It borders Veneto, Austria, Slovenia, and the Adriatic Sea. Right now, we are in Bisiacaria, a small pocket of land located between two rivers, the Isonzo and the Timavo. More uh, specifically, in the town of San Pier di Isonzo, which we locals like to call it San Piero. I grow about a third of an acre in mixed vegetables. And I, of course, I grow some, some radicchios. They're over here. Uh, I've got a uh, radicchio di Treviso Precoce, also known as Spadone, radicchio di Lusia, and then two really cool varieties of radicchio that a friend and mentor of mine, Andrea Piton, shared with me. It is a population of variegato radicchio that he selects for diversity. It's an explosion of different colors and shapes and then another red radicchio, which is called Radicchio Rosso dello Stella. This region is also known for, uh, of course, Rosa di Gorizia, or Rosa dell'Isonzo, Rosa Isontina, and Lidric Kulpok. Before we go to eat some really cool radicchio dish, uh, I wanted to give you a little lesson in dialects and languages of this region. Radicchio, here in Bisacchiaria, it's called Radic. In Trieste, about 20 miles east, they call it Radicio. In Friuli, across the river Isonzo, they speak another a completely different language, it's called Friulano, and they call Radicchio Lidric. All right, so let's go to my grandma's house. She is actually or, uh, born and raised in Veneto region, and she's gonna cook me some really yummy bean soup with some radicchio sprinkled on top. Let's go. Let's go inside. Oh, siamo arrivati pronti per mangiare. Nonna, cosa mangiamo? Eh, come ho fatto a finestra di farci anche radici, ci sono mangiare il Veneto, ah, ti piace? No, eh, buon, no, buon, no. Dai. Una volta eh, in tanto, sì. ma torno in Rio, sa, perché adesso poi in bisacchieria, ma in Veneto <ride> si mangiava così una volta. E allora mostrimi, mostrimi come si fa. Ecco, Inizia le fasi oi e dopo se c'ho il radice. Il radice, te lo metti dentro. Tu vuoi, eh? Qua metti porta, sì. Ecco, te E dopo se mangi. E dopo te inizia e te mangi. Ecco. Ah. E buon appetito. Buono. Buon appetito. Grazie. Grazie. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. So there's a lot of good information out there uh, on the YouTube site for, you know, Radicchio, more, you know, more history and cooking and growing Radicchio. But I think that that was a really cute one. So I wanted to share it with you guys. Um, so I'll take any questions that you guys have now. I know I went fast through a lot of things and we could spend a lot of time focusing on so many of those, but maybe we can do that another time in the future with Radicchio. <laughs> hey folks, thank you so much, Lane. And the Q&A is open, remains open. So please, please take uh, advantage of that. It should be at the bottom of your screen, depending on how your screen is set up. It's two screens that say Q&A and that, because we're recording, that is the way that we can interact and we will put your question forward. Given that we have nothing there right now, let's keep the Q&A open. And in the interest of time, I'm happy to pause to see if a question appears, but otherwise my suggestion is we move on to the tasting with Caleb and then come back to a question and answer uh, at the end that's shared by Lane and Caleb. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I'm going to take it away if that's okay. Uh, can everybody hear me all right? Great. Thanks so much, Lane. Uh, I really appreciated everything that you had to say. Uh, it's fine that, nice to finally meet you as well. Um, Lane and I have worked remotely and never really had the opportunity to meet each other. So this is uh, exciting for me as well. Um, I am here. I'm going to taste a few radicchio that uh, were 
picked up remotely uh, by students and we're going to have an opportunity to actually look at different radicchio and taste them. But first I wanted to give just a quick background about who I am as an individual. Um, I moved to uh, Olympia, Washington about three years ago. Uh, I worked at restaurants for a while, uh, prepping myself to go to Evergreen. And now I'm a student researcher at Evergreen State College. And I just finished my first season as a small scale uh, diverse organic farmer as well. Um, so I get to put on a bunch of different hats every day and uh, try to look at these things from different perspectives. Um, just a reminder, we will take a moment at the end of my uh, presentation to uh, answer any questions. So please in the Q&A section, if you have questions, we'd love to answer them and we will take time to do that at the end of this. Um, I'm going to share my screen uh, with you all and kind of walk through what um, we're going to be doing today. I have just a short amount of time for something that I would love to take hours to do. So I'm going to try to not talk too quickly, but breeze through this at the same time. Um, quickly, I'm going to share my screen to uh, this uh, tasting form that uh, some students are going to help follow through with. Um, if everybody can see this, uh, um, give me a thumbs up. But uh, otherwise, um, there is we're going to be tasting two different types of radicchio um, and then walking through kind of the flavor rating, um, how students might use this on their own or uh, end users would uh, enjoy tasting this. Um, as Sarah mentioned at the beginning, we also, I ha have a salad that she prepped and I ate it for dinner last night and then recreated it. Um, so I'll taste that again today quickly. Um, and then down here, just quickly want to highlight uh, this um, Culinary Breeding Network flavor wheel that they did around this squash. And it says there, it's a unleash your inner squash lexicon, which I thought was really, uh, really fitting to this whole idea. And maybe um, having students uh, try to view radicchio in this idea as well. Um, tasting very similarly uh, constructed plants, but then picking out the differences that they have, uh, albeit subtle. I'm gonna stop my screen share on that. And then also just quickly share my screen with um, a WordPress blog that I am um, the uh, I am authoring here. That is a nice uh, Rosa del Benito that I grew. Um, some, uh, so this is one of the varieties we're going to be tasting today. And here's another one of the varieties that I'll be tasting today. And I will, um, if you would like to look at my chicory brassica trial that I've been working on this uh, season, I will post a, or I'll copy this link and put it into the, um, the chat section. Um, but now enough of that, I'm going to start highlighting these radicchio that we're gonna be tasting today. So students had an opportunity to quickly come and pick up different radicchio varieties. Um, as Lane was talking about earlier, not only are there different varieties or cultivars of radicchio, but there's different types that uh, come from different uh, genetic backgrounds. So this long football shaped radicchio is uh, a Treviso precoce, kind of a late season, long day to maturity variety um, that can handle some nice winter and cold temperatures. Um, you saw a picture of the small little uh, head of, it's a, that is a red Chioja variety or type of radicchio. And the variety name of that one is Cereo. This one is Baldo. And these seeds came from Osborne Seed Company in uh, Skagit Valley, Washington, grown out. Um, Calliope Farms of Olympia, Washington grew the Treviso Precoce. And then I grew the Cereo heads uh, at my farm. Here I have a little station set up and I'll try to show it to you here. I have the, uh, cut up varieties that I'm going to be tasting. Here's a cross section so you can see uh, of the baldo. Um, this is the salad. And this is the uh, cereal uh, red kiosha variety. So we'll get into tasting that. Quickly, I'm going to taste this salad that kind of, uh, as Sarah mentioned, brings in a bunch of different um, flavor aspects uh, and kind of melts those flavors together. As I was tasting it yesterday, it was really interesting to see or to experience that full mouth coat um, and have the, all the different flavors interacting with each other. Um, this salad is lip smacking good, but I'm gonna take my headphones off so you don't have to, I'll keep the lip smacked myself. But I'm gonna taste this and then uh, kind of 
tell you what I'm experiencing through that. So um, I got to fully experience this salad last night and I had some things that I was prepped to say about it. Um, it's really nice. So there's a, there's apple in the salad and then there's a uh, nice um, acidic vinaigrette um, and some bacon in there. And then you have your radicchio. And as those flavors kind of hit each other and mash, uh, it coats my tongue. So in the back, I get like back in my uh, jaw, that's where the bitter for me really comes out. And it's really powerful, but it's such, uh, the flavor is sent so far back in my mouth. And then the sweet is right on the tip of my tongue. And that acidity kind of washes over all of that. Um, and those flavor interactions really uh, blend together with each other. And so that bitter, uh, well, I should say any of those flavors uh, aren't overpowering and they're all interacting with each other really nicely. It's, it's quite interesting. Um, together, and we've been doing this for a while, but uh, there are students that are going to be tasting these with me, but I'll be tasting these and walking through um, kind of what I'm experiencing, and um, I apologize to the students, but we'll have time to go through this uh, later in the quarter or maybe later next quarter, but um, again, this is the uh, Baldo uh, Treviso Percoche, the Sirio Red Chioja, and um, I'm gonna be tasting these and it's a, a funny to do these things over Zoom, but we're doing the best that we can. So uh, I appreciate you holding in there with me, but um, I'm gonna go ahead and try to taste these um, and then kind of tell you what I'm experiencing. Also my lemon water to uh, kind of cleanse my palate of that uh, super tasty salad. All right, Baldo, lip smacking good. Wow, that's really interesting. Um, so I tasted some of the variegated, the white section of the stem, as you can see, and tried to pay attention to how that differs from the red leafy part of the uh, radicchio. Um, the white section on the uh, baldo was really sweet, actually. It didn't have uh, very much bitterness. It was very earthy um, and sweet, but the bitterness really came from the red section of that leaf, and that coated the whole mouth. Um, I was excited to see how the uh, how those two things differed in that one in that one head of radicchio. So really sweet in this large white section. And most of this uh, head, as you can see, you have that long, very thick sections of these heads that uh, include a lot of that um, white variegation and very sweet where the red is very bitter. So you're having those two uh, flavor complexes interacting with each other um, just within this raw plant. We'll move on to the Syria Red Kyoja. Nothing like watching somebody else eat. <laughs> um, the uh, red kyoja, there's a lot less variegation. You can kind of see it here. Um, these are smaller heads, but you have a lot of the white variegation towards the end. And then the inside is really heavy on that red leafy section. But the flavor was, uh, um, the bitterness was a little more intense for me, um, but the sweetness still stands in that white section. Um, 
and uh, I really enjoyed, well, I'm not going to say which one I enjoyed more, um, but the ideas for me as I think about this, uh, putting on the different hats uh, as my cooking background and my farming background, and um, uh, I think about pairing these things with nice earthy flavors, as we saw in um, Davide's, uh, I'm pronouncing that wrong, but um, Davide's uh, in a video, him and his family uh, just take some big old fat chunks of radicchio and throw it right on top of this really earthy bean soup. And um, I'm sure that that uh, earthiness really melts together nicely with this springy, bitter, and um, really vibrant uh, vegetable. But um, I could talk for hours about this, but I want to leave time for Q&A and any other um, sections that we want to touch base on really quick, please. But I really appreciate you sitting here with me and watching me eat. And uh, uh, I will put in my email address into the chat and that link to my blog. And uh, if you have any questions, please reach out to me at any time and I, will, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you. Um, can I add something? Can I say something? Um, please. So it's really interesting. You know, I mean, the, the thing that I'm always, every single time we do a tasting, we have to deal with is like making sure that we're all tasting like the same part of the plant because we have to be comparing the same thing. And when you, I saw the shredded pieces, I was like, Ooh, how's he going to do this? Like, are you going to take, make sure that you're taking like the white, as you said, is sweet. The purple is bitter. And I mean, that's what like when we try to get people like starting to eat radicchio, a lot of times we push them toward like the Castle Franco and the Musia types because they are, um, they're, they're the green ones and the more white ones because they're, they're more mild. And it was interesting when we went to Italy and we visited in 2014, I actually went to visit a, a seed company, a radicchio seed company, and they showed me, so the Kyoja is the round one, right? And they had maybe 25 different varieties of Kyoja because they also breed it so tightly for a particular space and time. You know, it's like for different latitudes and, the, and with just within Italy. And then also like every 10 days, they had a different like seeding for e each seeding. They had a different variety. And then in addition, they had different markets, whereas um, they in Italy, they really like the bitterness. Right. So the Kyoja heads were mostly purple. They had very little of the white rib. And then but they were also growing the growers that I went to visit were growing for like the market in the UK and shredded up and put into bags, right? And so that's like a really big segment of the radicchio market, even in Italy now, is that people buy them pre-made bags because everybody is turning into like, we don't have time for anything and we don't have time to cut radicchio. <laughs> so we get it. <laughs> but in, in the UK, they're not so into bitter. And so they breed specifically ones that have more mid ribs. So they're more mild. But it is, it does make it very challenging when we're trying to taste these things to make sure that we have equal amounts of it. And then also like, even like with squash, it's like our, well, from, from fruit to fruit, they can be very different from one another, much more so than I think head to head with radicchio, but um, from fruit to fruit, they can be different. And it's like, where exactly are you tasting it? Is it close to the top? Is it close to the bottom? Are we in the middle? Is it close to the rind? Is it in the inside? It all becomes, you know, <sighs> <laughs> you know, it's own thing. But um, I just thought it was interesting to to make that point that they they breed so differently and make and have different ratios of like that mid rib to like the bitter, more bitter um, red part of the leaf. That's really interesting. I really appreciated what you had to say about um, focusing on those end users. Um, the chefs and the consumers uh, that are eventually going to be buying and eating the things that uh, we are growing and um, breeding towards. Uh, in the Rad TV um, event that just happened, I, I, in my pajamas, sat on the computer all day and enjoyed that uh, and really had a great time um, doing that remotely. But uh, in, in that, you highlighted a bunch of uh, chefs that work with these uh, these for vegetables. And um, one of the very first one that you highlighted was Elise Landry of the Chicory restaurant here in Olympia, Washington, mm -hmm. who is a good friend. And I, I actually worked in her restaurants um, and now she's just started her very own uh, restaurant. And uh, I sold a bunch of vegetables to her this season. And we got to talk a lot about uh, 
of this. And um, so reevaluating how these uh, growers interact with chefs and um, having her come to me and ask me to grow different varieties for her restaurant and um, uh, great. closing that whole loop, you know? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I mean, because we really have, that's what has been hard with um, with the radicchio, we were seeing enormous amount of movement. I mean, this is why I think I got the grant. I was able to finally make, I've been writing grants for radicchio for a long time and they never get funded. And I think that after doing the, you know, the Sagra for several years and it becoming, you know, without any kind of financial backing and just partnering with restaurants that really loved it also and doing it, I was able to find between that and then that, I think did drive a lot of, you know, more demand, at least locally, that people were buying directly from farmers, I was able to show that there was an increase in sales and demand for radicchio. Um, I lost my train of thought. Oh, but but the, the chefs have been the ones that have really been the ones that have been pushing that out into the, the marketplace, I think, because you go to a restaurant and you eat a radicchio salad, and it's good. You know, but a lot of times you go buy your radicchio and you try to make that salad at home and not so, that people aren't that, they don't know how to do it as well, right? And I mean, that's for a lot of different reasons. I mean, I think quality of the ingredients that they're using, the olive oils, even the salt, everything like makes a difference, the, the vinegar, um, but just not really knowing like how to properly pair it like you're talking about. It's like radicchio can handle a lot of strong flavors. It can handle strong cheese. It can handle strong anchovy, something else like that to, to pair it up, soaking it in ice water ahead of time, all of these things. And then even though we did just watch an Italian eat it raw, you often, most often in Italy, you eat it cooked and cooking it in lots of various ways um, is, it like really mellows out those flavors. So if people are not liking that, they can, um, you can easily mellow it out by just adding it to risotto or to a soup or to a pasta or on a pizza or whatever, and still getting a nice like little bitterness, but not as overpowering. But it's like, it's now, you know, previously it was a lot easier to push radicchio on people because it was like, well, go to this restaurant and have it in a really fantastic way and you like it. But to then empower, I mean, in the end, this is what I want people to do anyway, to empower people to buy the raw product from a farmer, go home and make it. But it is more challenging for a lot of people because, um, so that's what we're, we're trying to get recipes and get that. We did radicchio boxes that you could buy radicchio, uh, a special box from a farmer. Um, and it had like six heads of radicchio, three different types. We made a little video that you unboxed it and you're like, oh, these are the different types. And then we had recipes in there that were like, these are, this is the thing that you should do with this one. This is the way you should do with that one. Um, you know, and so trying to get people engaged in that way so it doesn't slow down like consumption of radicchio because we don't have restaurants right now, which just were like a big part of the, like, you know, the program for radicchio. Hey folks, we've got four questions now. Um, Steve, maybe if you have ideas on this, is kind of, um, again, teaching colleague from Terroir Merwar, who's our agroecologist um, on the team, um, and just channeling in on this uh, idea of a recipe. It is included in that tasting sheet. So anybody who has access to the Climate Academy website, or if one of us uh, has a chance to drop it in the Q&A, we'll be happy to do that. Um, specific question I'm going to guide Caleb to and then turn it over to Steve. Which was from the farm of the two we tasted, the cereal and the baldo, which was from the farm and which was from Evergreen? Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, okay, so baldo, uh, the uh, Treviso Precoce was from the, was from Calliope Farm, which is uh, about 30 minutes south of Olympia. And then the Cereo, which was the small red, uh, round red Kyosha, uh, was grown on my own personal farm. Neither of them came from Evergreen's farm. But I do have uh, nine different varieties of radicchio currently growing at the Evergreen farm under the Novik uh, variety trial this, this year, three replications. And join the Terroir Merwar program and you will have a chance to taste it winter quarter. <laughs> Steve, the other question. Yeah, so there, there's a few questions that are um, 
from different folks, but they relate to seed sourcing and, and selecting uh, a, a well-suited seed to your particular locale. And so there's inter interrelated questions are sort of like, where would you buy your radicchio seeds and why, and what variety would you plant? And then as you work with the international um, teams, what, what um, dealing with international seeds, like if you want to do that laws, regulations, permits. So those are the, the, the uh, maybe some nuanced ones. And obviously which variety you would pick is going to be dependent on your locale, but maybe speak a little bit about the seed sourcing and where are good sources. So there's two, the two guys that you saw in the video that I just mentioned really briefly that had their arms around each other that are Italian. That, those are two different seed companies. One is Levantia and one is Smarties. And um, they both used to work for a seed company called TNT. The, these are basically like the best sources for radicchio. Um, they have open pollinated and they have hybrid varieties. Um, and that the Levantia seed will be available through Osborne seed. So they are here in, they're in Washington. Um, Osborne has very good varieties of radicchio. Um, they test them for many years here. They have, they have variety trials. You could probably get them to do a presentation for your class. Uh, Linda did it a presentation and talked about specific varieties of each of those that you could watch that's on um, the Rad TV on YouTube. And she's going to present during Radicchio Week as well, the later season, which is what Caleb is doing with Novik is the later season slot we're really looking at in Novik, which is those that would be like heading up and be able to be harvested and sold in like February and March, because it's a slot where we don't have a lot of things to eat, right? So there's fall slots, there's winter slots, there's, you know, early spring slots. So it depends on what you want, but they have really good information on the Osborne website and you can get seed and then you can, you can get seed in smaller packages. I mean, they come in like probably like a hundred or 200 seeds in a package. Um, and then Smarties, you'll be able to get you in smaller packages. And that's going to be this, I told you there's a collaboration between Culinary Breeding Network and Uprising Seeds and Smarties. It's called Gusto Italiano. I didn't put it in here. I don't know why, because there's already so much to talk about. But there'll be special line of seeds that you can get in packages for gardeners. Um, and as well as, you know, farmers could buy it too. But um, that will be from Smarties. And those are all open pollinated and organic. Um, and they all have been tested. I coordinated them being tested on three different farms in Oregon and Washington, um, and they've been really fantastic. Um, so those are those those will be. I would say those are the two places to buy uh, radicchio seed. Really, there's a lot of other um, seed companies and breeders that I love dearly in the United States, um, but I would that I work with all the time. And but I wouldn't recommend their varieties compared to these. Super, thank you, Lane. And just to throw out there as a plant pathologist that yes, uh, just grabbing your own seeds and running around with them internationally is not permitted. Um, there are regulations and phytosanitary permits. So um, we appreciate Lane uh, doing that in a responsible way and, and we'll let Lane do that for us um, and then get those at the local seed companies. And um, following up on that, there's a question if, if uh, the the Culinary Breeding Network, if you've been working at all with the Arc of Taste, with Slow Food, and, and then also, where do you see the Culinary Breeding Network going in the next 10 years? Okay, so as far as Arc of Taste, I was on the local um, Portland like board for a little while. Uh, it's kind of fizzled out though, and isn't that active. But some of the, like some of these varieties in this Gusto Italiano um, project, there's mostly radicchio, but then there'll be three brassicas and two of which are Arc of Taste, or they're, I should say, they're not the, the US Arc of Taste, they're the Presidia, which is kind of the Italian equivalent to Arc of Taste. Um, if you, and I can send you some information about that. One is called Fialaro and another one is called Bassano. And they are brassicas that are grown in, in traditional and basically on the equivalent of Arc of Taste, but in the Italian version of that. Um, and I have, I mean, I've worked with that before. I've done a big dinner at like Organicology for like 700 people that were had like, you know, I think it was like 16 different like arc of taste things in the menu. It was a lot of work. It was pretty crazy because <laughs> it was a dinner in February. So we had to preserve things and like, I had to find like, where's like, there's a, there's a cherry called the Black Republican and there's like 
three of them left <laughs> as like pollinators in the, you know, in Oregon. And I found the trees and we had to get them harvested and, you know, all this stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm a big proponent of that. I've worked with it whenever that has come, has come up. So as, as you know, the Culinary Breeding Network, a lot of it obviously is about creating new varieties, uh, which is different than heirloom. Uh, or arc of taste or like traditional varieties, but I also am a big proponent of those, those as well. Um, and that second question, oh, CBN. Well, well, let's see. Well, it depends on how much, how many grants I can write. You know, this is completely grant funded as well as my position at the university. So I write a grant of grants. Um, I, you know, I really do like the way that um, the Culinary Breeding Network works right now with like larger, um, research projects like behind barley and value added grains and Novik, we have like, you know, a lot of very serious, you know, research that's happening. Um, and to be like the outreach arm and the communication to the public, I want to continue to do that. Um, and then continue to do more work around uh, promotion of particularly, particularly these underappreciated vegetables that um, are something that could be, um, as long as they can be, um, you know, obviously um, financially beneficial to, to growers. Like I don't pick th weird things that, you know, are not uh, going to be, you know, uh, yeah, financially reasonable for farmers to do. But like with radicchio, I see that, that if we could get people turned on to it and excited about it, that's something that a lot of farmers are that have chosen to go that route are doing very well financially. Um, so I want to continue a lot of um, promotion. Um, and so, you know, focusing on marketing and promotion of different vegetables and partnering with researchers to be like the outreach arm is I just want to be able to do more of that. Um, and it would be great to be able to like um, fund myself and maybe two other people to do that would be awesome because there's definitely no lack of um, demand for it. Oh, let me just say really quick. These are radicchio earrings. They're not on the Etsy site, but these are the Kyoja. They also make Treviso. It's a, these really great women that have a farm down in Corvallis and they have a company called Plant Posse and they're all handmade. And they do all these vegetables. And every time I have like a different vegetable that I want like something out there for, they they make, they make I just, can you make collards? Can you make this, can you make that? So they made radicchio ones for us and they're really great. And you can buy them on their website. Fantastic, Lane. Um, as host, Sarah, how are we doing if we're having to hit the, 12 o'clock time or can we keep going or where are we at with that? Just got one minute. Um, I'm seeing one version of a question yet. The connection to the farm to school and the cafeteria network. Love to, given that one saying that's um, used around here is that COVID has actually been very good for local food systems. Um, CSAs are at peak enrollments. People are willing to pay for and care about local food. So Lane, anything you'd like to share about that? Um, actually, right now, I'm writing a, a specialty crops block program grant in Washington with Laura Lewis. I don't know if you guys know her, Community Food Systems with WSU. She's up in um, near Port Townsend. And we are writing a grant to um, promote, you know, uh, like under, so as we, a lot of farmers had to shift over to CSA, a lot of which, a lot of the farmers I work with had done a lot, like, mostly CSA and then had moved more to really to restaurants, you know, we saw a lot of that where restaurants were buying and through different avenues, right? And so we saw this shift that they're like, well, we have to go back to offering a lot of CSA. And that has been really fantastic. It has had some challenges for farmers in that, you know, I mean, to be perfectly honest, they can be a real pain in the butt for, for farmers because they get a lot of complaints. There's a lot of handholding. There's a lot of like, well, I don't really like this. Can I change it in for this and that? You know, I mean, I, I would like to be able to communicate to people like more like the spirit of why we are part of CSAs and what that's really all about. So that people would be um, more on board with that. But, um, but still people kind of aren't you know, they think of it still like as a grocery shopping or, or a farmer's market a lot of times where they don't want something or they, and so the farmers have to field those questions and deal with, with a lot of that. And um, 
So I'm writing a couple of grants right now to help them. And so I've asked, you know, I've sent out a big survey in Oregon and Washington and asked, what do you get the most complaints about? Basically, what are the things that grow really well that you want to continue to grow and give to your customers, but you want them to not complain so much about like, how can we get it? So I will be, take charge of getting them excited about it, writing up the histories of these things, getting the recipes together and all these things that we're doing like for, we've done for winter squash in the past, we're doing for radicchio to try to get people more excited. I'll say that I have so many people that contact me that say, I don't like radicchio, but I'm really trying to now. <laughs> Because they 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 like the story of it. They like, you know, the pink one. I'm sorry, sir, we didn't even like really talk a lot about that. But I mean, gosh, you have a pink vegetable. Everybody in the world wants to wants to eat it, even if they don't like it, they're trying to eat it. So um identifying those, you know, those vegetables that we can put a lot more focus on to get more people excited about. And in Washington, to get back to the, the school program, working with the school program to get those things. So we've selected what theirs are going to be and they work with the schools to get it into their program so that we have kids eating it too and have a lot more focus on it. So there'll be an entire week maybe of fennel and then fennel will be eaten by kids in school. Um, so that we, so it's not just, you know, not just partnering with you know CSA farmers and farmers market farmers, but like retailers and and um, and wholesalers as well, and then also the schools as much as we can. Yeah. Great, folks. We are at time, so a big shout out to the tech people. It all worked. Thank you so much, Lane. Yep. The first of many many interactions. So many things happening. Thank you so much. And Caleb, we're going to taste more of what you've grown winter quarter. Thanks everyone.